Good afternoon. Today is Wednesday, March the 23rd, and this is a webinar on Motive Wave, and in particular, something that I enjoy using in Motive Wave are pivot points. And I use the pivot points in a very specific fashion. I actually use them to create Fibonacci zones on the arrival. So the first thing I want you to realize is that this is a very functional space. And so I'm going to actually select all and delete all so that we are looking at something completely empty. All right. I use this MACD. I use several readings for the MACD. This one today is the EMA 10, 20, and 7. It's a pretty fast MACD, and it helps me understand where buying pressure is and where it might be in to resistance or support. Now, I will say this. Having taught a lot of students over a number of years, I do notice that a lot of people don't know how white to read a MACD. And so um, being the math nerd that I am, it's easier to read these momentum indicators if you understand the math behind it, but not necessary. You don't have to understand the math behind it. And the math is not particularly complex, but who wants to go back to school when we're sitting trading, right? None of us really want to do that. So let's just take a quick an easy look at what's going on here. If you just have a MACD and no moving averages floating around, there are two things to look at when you have this MACD. And we're going to be, we're going to talk. The reason that I'm spending just a few moments on this MACD is because the way we're going to use the pivot forms with the MACD will tell us whether the region we're coming into is potential support or resistance and what we need to do at that moment. And so for this, I use the signal method, both the EMAs, and I use a 10, a 20, and a 7. It makes for, you know, my 7 makes for these little jagged spaces, and my 10 and 20 make for the smoother lines on that space. All right, so that's the way I like to do it from a display perspective. I have my signal line, my MACD line, and of course the histogram. I do not do a top bottom fill. I think that's a little noisy, but you could if that's your thing. And then the up marker, down marker gives you that crossover space. And you could use that if you like, you know, it gives you the crossover event, tells you up, down. I mean, that works fine. I would prefer to look at it in the moment rather than have those up down lines. But you know what? We'll leave them there just so that we can look at the charts overall. All right. So I'm going to use the futures because I spend a lot of time in the futures. But if you so choose, you can use a regular chart. Here is Facebook, right? Facebook has got three different formation levels and notice how it comes right into that region. It's so beautiful in terms of reading this formation. It's actually quite lovely. So if you only work with stocks and you don't work with the futures, which I would urge you to step into the futures, if you study and learn to trade well, the futures can reward you extremely handsomely. Of course, if you have limited skills, futures can destroy your account. And so that being said, you've been forewarned. Hey, listen, everything I talk about here is from an educational perspective. At no time am I trying to convince you to buy or sell any instrument. I am not a broker. I am not a registered agent. I am not an investment advisor. I'm an individual trader that trades to eat <laughs> every day. So we'll talk about Facebook in a little bit. We'll use the same sort of mechanics here and we'll do it with the same thing. We're not even going to look at a single moving average here. And you're going to see how very beautifully this all works together. Now, of course, you can use moving averages. I do. They're sitting right there in the chart. But the point is you can understand how to read these 
uh, trading formations quite well into the early part of the day. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you what this morning's levels looked like. And here we have um, our intraday targets for members. And the one we're going to look at, of course, is the ES. And I'm going to expand that image fairly rapidly here. And we're going to see that this morning I put this out and I said, all right, here are the ranges that we are looking at. We're looking at a space that is, oops, we need that MACD, don't we? We'll do it up here because we know it's not going up. We have the MACD form here and we have these levels of FIB zones that are created essentially by pivot points and they're going to give us ranges of formations. And so the ranges say this, here's how you interpret them off the bat. Green areas are pushing up into expansion zones. So if you see a green area and these are overlapped, this is a weekly pivot formation, this big one right here, and the smaller ones are 10 and 12 hour formations. Now, because I am an intraday trader, those are very important to me. How is my sequence of movement going to bring me down into my targets on the day in a 10 and 12 hour period from the beginning as I rotate forward? And you can see where these begin. This one, begins over here and ends over here. This one begins over here and ends over here. And this one covers the entire week. So we're going to see that in general. All right. So what this tells me here is the following. If I'm sitting, here's why moving averages can throw us off just a little bit. Because if we think that if we're sitting above our moving averages, we have a lot of bullish momentum. But our very interesting MACD that is using the EMA shows from our histogram and from our lines that the momentum here is damp. And in fact, even though we're sitting above the moving averages, it's actually negative. So what it tells me is that these areas up here are very unlikely to be penetrated. And if they are penetrated, they're going to reverse. See, this essentially told me the same sort of thing yesterday, which is why I wrote on my blog, listen, if we have any range expansion, it's going to reject the area. There's not enough power of momentum to hold the chart. And so that really is what this is saying. It's saying, hey, listen, if it expands, you need to be careful about going long. And as a matter of fact, it's a better place to go short into support. Now, traders that work with me every day, we know this. Um, someone says, are you showing any charts? I can only hear you with a blank board. Everybody else sees the charts though. Yes. Tell me screens. Yes. Charts. Yes. Okay. Um, Solomon, perhaps go out and come back in again. And that ought to help you from that space. All right. Pardon the interruption there, but thank you very much everyone for confirming that we could see the charts. So that's what you look at. You know, a lot of us are trained incorrectly to buy breakouts and sell breakdowns. And that's really uh, one of the ways to expose yourself to the most amount of risk you possibly can, particularly from an intraday perspective. You should, in my mind, in my approach, it is better to take a long off the bounce of support and a short off the rejection of resistance. But that doesn't feel good to us because we seem to be going in an opposite direction. Hey, listen, the candlesticks are moving up. Are you telling me I should be shorting? If the environment suggests that, then the answer, of course, is yes. If the environment does not suggest that, the answer is no. Whether the environment supports that or not really depends on how well you can read technical indicators. And it is my experience that a lot of people have trouble with that um, for a number of reasons. But anyway, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a space that says, hey, these areas are upside projections, but if we get into the region, we should reject the zones and move forward, all right? These are the baselines for the pivots for the 10-hour and the 12-hour one, 
of course, and then these, the actual pivot points for the weekly uh, pivots we can see right there. So we do see this morning's picture giving us this example of motion. Now, if we look at this afternoon, we have nothing here, of course, but we can see that what happened was the chart did not expand into those regions. And as a matter of fact, as the histogram began to print under here, and we had the crossover here, the crossover actually starts here, we get a lower high, and that's confirmed with momentum also at a lower high. And then the crossover gives us the range of motion downward. And so you'll notice this target where the chart shows up is actually at the bottom of that fib. That motive wave gave to us before the open of the day. Just shy of that. 2026. Now, if you were able to take a short from, you know, that 2038 or 2037 area, somewhere around there, which is what I have actually in the blog, somewhere in that area, to take the area short, and you came all the way down to 2026.50, that would be a very nice trade for if you sat and were able to take it into the target. So let me show you how to build these pivots on your charts. First thing you want to do is you go to your study, and if you don't have any recent studies up, because maybe you're new, you're going to go to Add Study. And it's very intuitive. Just type in the word pivot. You're going to get pivot points. And it's going to pop out, right? Tell you all the different kinds of pivots. My favorites are the woody pivots. I consider them to be most accurate. A lot of people choose classic pivots. They do the Camarillas. And these I find to be uniquely... Uh, generated inside of Motivate, probably some other places, but for me, I haven't seen these any other places but inside of Motive Wave, and I do enjoy using them particularly. Now, Woody's pivots, a lot of people use them, and so I, I like making sure that my Woody's pivots are plotted, and so you can see them here. Resistance level one, this is a weekly pivot, and so we can see here we are midweek, and yesterday, we came into resistance level one and began to back down. But you can tell the whole week, we're essentially caught between the main entry of the pivot on the week and resistance level one. So that's always important for us to consider. A lot of times, if you read my blog, you'll see that my weekly resistance levels are associated very closely with those pivots unless there's a congestion zone floating around from price that gives me a better shot at that. Properties of the pivot point areas. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Would you give me another sentence that asks that same thing? So in any case, so we have the Woody's pivots, that's, those are the ones I like. And those are always plotted there. Now, the fib zone pivots that I like work like this. And so, of course, because it's a study that we've just added, recent is going to bring it up. This is my default pivot, but it um, can certainly be anything that you want it to be. This is just my default. So if I wanted to look at weekly pivots that were associated with a fib zone, it gives me a zone of motion. Instead of just being a line, it gives me a range that the chart can go into. Now, the reason I like ranges for fib zones, and I'm going to move this to a four-hour chart so we can see it a little bit better. The reason I like ranges is because our brains have tendency to get boxed in in terms of just strict lines. We go, oh, I got to short it there. That's really not what a pivot says to you, but here's how you want to read this. If you come into a resistance zone on a pivot, right, you're going through the day and you notice that it's up there, at resistance level one or resistance level two or anything like that, and I'm going to delete this one so we can just see this right here. If you look down at your MACD and you've got this kind of divergent action, 
and your histogram is below the zero line, usually means that your bounces are going to get sold. Notice I did not say anything about it saying that, that my upside's going to get bought or my lows are going to get sold. That's not how you read these things at all. This drift of momentum tells me I have a likelihood of reversing off my highs. That's what that tells me. So when I see a bounce up and a struggle here, and I notice that it is significantly lower, I know I've got no business going long up over those levels. Okay, that's exactly what it is that that's telling you. How do you know where to go? You look to the left for where it is that it stops. You can see that 2029 is fairly important. We sort of closed at or near that area. That's really an important area, but we continue to drift. Momentum continues to fade from that space. And so really, that's how you read momentum coming into resistance. It is the failure of highs that will drift you back into support. All right. Now, could you say, hey, listen, if I took a low at uh, 2037, if I took the short right there, couldn't I still move ahead? Yes, but that's also not the relative low. It's just the loss of this congestion and the continuation of motion. What we have a tendency to do, particularly if we are not secure in our trading strategies, is that we'll wait and wait and wait until it drifts down off of the level, and then we'll go, oh, okay, this is where my short is. Obviously, it's going to be short here. A lot of people were looking for it to lose 20, 30, 50, or 20, 30, and certainly it did do that, and it is sitting underneath that, but it's a much better trade if you can watch the bounce into resistance and then watch the fade as it moves down into what is likely support. So for an intraday perspective, I'll go back to these pivot points. Here's what I like to use. I like to use a 10-hour Fib Zone 2. That gives me a range of motion. Here's what I want to show you. When the chart is quiet overnight, like it was essentially last night, right? Essentially quiet, not, not super big, right? These fib zones, the 10 hour fib zone will be very compact. Now notice the midline of fib zones are really important. Do not ignore them. And you make sure that you plot them because look at this comes right into the region, rejects the area. This one comes right into that fib zone area, rejects the region. And so we're at the top and the bottom of the range, but these midpoints give you very clear spaces that tell you, listen, if I'm struggling around this area and I have all kinds of negative momentum, I know if I see a spike and it collides into these 50% zones, I've got myself a short. And notice, look at where this thing comes in at the 10-hour Fib Zone 2, comes in at the 20, 25, 25, almost on the nose of the 50% area. All right? Now, is it going to be a little bit of a luck of the Irish for you to do a 10-hour Fib Zone or a 12-hour Fib Zone and come up with the proper thing, yeah, you know what? That 12-hour Fib zone brings me into my 2026 area. So you miss it by three ticks. I don't really care about that, right? If I've got, you know, what would that be? Two, three, four, 12, 40 ticks sitting around there. I'm going to be great with missing out on three ticks here if this tells me where my target is, all right? There's also a fib zone one or a plain old fib zone, and that's this area. You'll notice it has a different type of expansion. The fib zone areas sometimes are smaller. So if I put a 10 hour fib zone, it'll be more compact. That 10 hour fib zone is relying on this tight range of motion and assuming the charts will not move into their expanded levels. Notice the baseline here of this fib, this fib zone event 
actually ends up now becoming the resistance area. I like using the Fib Zone too because it gives me a good range of expansion. It doesn't tell me that it's going all the way to 2021, but if I have continued downside motion on my MACD and my negative momentum on my histogram is still there, it is still telling me, hey, listen, if it bounces into these midlines or into these fib areas, that is a short. It's still going to be a short, and that's what it's telling you. I can trade this without any moving averages whatsoever, just by understanding the nature of momentum and then being very wise to where support and resistance lie. That's really, really important to me, where support and resistance lies. If I look at the 12-hour Fib Zone 2, which is one of my favorite spaces, and I look to the left, I can see all of this congestion. I can see the congestion at 2025. I can see another bit of congestion at 2023-25. So far, what this chart is telling me over the next overnight hours is that if I do not recover this region and this momentum stays negative, I will drift further into these fib zones and they will give me targets. So your question has got to be, as it's moving through this formation, what is this chart actually going to do? Well, we happen to be stopped, right? We're not printing anything for the next couple of moments anyway. And so what we are looking at here is a shift in momentum. Now notice this. We have lower lows, and we have lower lows also in the line itself. Our histogram is showing a bit of positive congestion, so meaning divergence. Sorry about that. It's showing positive divergence because this is down here, this is up here, and the price continues to go down. What does that tell me? It still tells me that I have negative momentum. But it tells me that I have a likelihood of holding anything that pulls back really hard right now or gives me a big wick. Chances are buyers are going to sit there and push me up into the resistance zone before I can take the short. So the question is, where's the valid trade from that space? It's going to be, hey, listen, do something super simple. Wait for the cross, and then take a look at where your support and resistance is. So notice this. If I see this cross down here, right, that means it shows up at the movement of this candlestick right here. I need to look for my congestion to the left and wait. I don't take my short right here necessarily. I could, but you wouldn't want to take it full size. I certainly wouldn't. I would have an order sitting out here at the congestion zone, anticipating maybe a wick or two underneath it, right there, anticipating that my chart's going to come up and take that trade. And, well, wouldn't you know it, it actually did, right? That would come down, it would bounce right back up, and it would take me into that space. But notice that, do a rewind on this, you're going to be able to use that quite definitively. If you wait for the cross and then watch for the fail test, it's going to tell you what it is that's going on. The same thing right here. Look at where this crossover comes. It comes out right there. This is the candlestick that it starts printing on. As this, you don't take it when it says that. You turn around and you look to the left. You see where congestion is. It's right around there. You assume it's going to come back fairly close to it. You put an order out right there, and then you watch for it to take the long, and if it cannot hold the space and it comes right back into resistance and starts fading, you need to cut and run. Obviously, you need to pay attention to your charts when you are doing trades like that. For many of us, we are swing traders. And so what we do, I'll be looking at this for Facebook, what we will do is, from a study perspective, 
Of course, you want to create those weekly woodies. I mean, I like the weekly woodies. Clearly, we can see here, let's use this uh, up down arrow stuff. I don't really like for anything to tell me what to do, which is <laughs> my parents really hated that. I just want you to know. But these arrows here do give us some space to understand what's going on. And notice this. When you see a pullback here, see how this crossover and you got a downside arrow? When you have a downside arrow and it's sitting at the base of support, it is usually an incorrect level, particularly if it has slope. One, if it has slope. Two, if it's sitting right at support, probably not telling you it's a breakdown. It's probably not telling you it's a breakdown. Here, this is crossing over at this level, so it could be likely that it comes into this area and then bounces again. This is the arrow that this has come up on. So you look for the congestion up over this region here, up in here, 112.70, 112.67, something like that. And that would be where you would initiate some sort of trade short as the chart begins to drift down. Shorts are only going to be highly viable for you if the histogram is also sitting under the zero point, right? This is an area, look at this one. This shows right here, this arrow goes off at a, I mean, what is that? Let's see how many, how much volume gets there. What do I see? Volume, 3,100 shares. That's quite a few shares that are just sitting there. Somebody gets out of the space, but look to the left. You see all the congestion? So. If the rule is, hey, listen, if I am near congestion that I see to the left, right up here is the midline of my fib, and I see that congestion, and that's showing me the rollover, I've got to wait for the retracement of that area. I cannot anticipate that this area near support is actually going to give me a short. I can't. Because I can see support directly to the left, and I know buyers are going to come in. So if you're looking at these guys and you're saying, all right, where is this likely to come from a weekly perspective, and you look at a four-hour chart, you can always take those very same pivot points, and instead of using the one week, use a fib zone two that's going to give you an extension of where it is the chart is in terms of its range of motion. And the four-hour chart, look at this. We've got divergence, right? We have motion that's giving us higher highs. We have divergent energies that just gave us a long, which means, hey, listen, if I can come back and hold 112, it is likely that I will bounce back up into my 113 area, but because we have divergent action, we cannot anticipate it's going to give us a higher high. It could. It certainly could. If these guys stay on top of the zero line and your movement is positive, you are going to have a likelihood of more upside action. If the line is already moving over, and it's sitting like that. Remember, you see this cross? I don't know if you notice this space, but this cross really tells you when the arrows up or down really tell you where the histogram is, right? A downside arrow means the histogram is going to start printing on the downside. Upside arrow says the histogram is going to start printing to the upside. doesn't tell you whether that momentum is beginning to wane to the downside or drift to the upside, as in this case. We just have to sort of pay attention. That's why I like histograms that give me color separations and tell me to tell me when the chart is actually losing momentum, because the loss of momentum comes well before the crossover, right? So that's it right here. So taking a look at Facebook, we can see a couple of things telling us that the chart is likely exhausted and maybe floating into a little bit of a sideways to a grinding up pattern. So far, what we see is when divergence is negative, right? When we've got the histogram 
printing underneath here and then it turns positive it starts chopping around this space what it says is if that's my arrow i need to wait for the motion to stabilize itself to see whether i can take the trade long stabilize itself at support which could be the 112 area or the 112.45 area but i know fairly well that i'm going to bump into trouble right here this is telling me, my fib zone event is telling me that I'm likely to have an expansion trouble event as it gets into these top spaces combined with what the MACD is doing. So does this mean you have to sort through and think through your trades? Uh, yes, it does. It really, really does. The nice thing about using these zones to help you into the space is the following. If you have upward momentum, meaning you've got a histogram that's moving up, you've got this line sitting above zero. See, if the line is sitting above zero, you also have a lot of positive momentum. If the line remains below zero, you have negative momentum, but not if it's upward sloping. That negative momentum doesn't even matter if this begins to upward slope and then gets above the zero line, right? So it's how to look at these all together to determine. If you're up here and you see this negative line and you see this negative cross over here and this positive cross over here and this negative and that positive, you might be saying to yourself, what am I looking at there? is this histogram above zero if it's above zero you get to look to the targets above so you look for the pullbacks to go long at support and congestion areas just like this the problem is divergent action is coming into the picture here so you know that a breakout is a bad place to buy a position instead the pullback is going to be more ideal no, I don't do any breath indicators. Um, not, a, not at this juncture, really, I don't. Suffice to say, if you have particularly intraday um, ideas that you would like to watch develop in the chart, or you're a short-term swing trader, using these target areas combined with momentum don't even have to have the moving average if you're just looking at the spaces and evaluating them properly. Listen, my moving averages are probably going to be flat to down here simply because I was moving sideways and now I'm moving down. Essentially, if I've got a high, a low, a lower high, and a lower low, I know I've got a momentum drift along with my trend drift into support. But if I'm sitting at support and I see divergence, I know that my bounces into resistance are possible. Notice, I'm not saying turnarounds and, move, and moves higher. I'm saying bounces into resistance. That's all it's telling me. Now, if it ends up holding over my resistance area, that's going to be a different story altogether. But learn to look at the chart in pieces to realize, hey, listen, this could turn around. This could turn all the way around and go right back up. But at this juncture, the trade I have that's in the bag at this base is that my pullbacks are going to give me that first bounce, right? They're going to give me a little bit of bounce. If I'm looking for the trend event, it is obvious that it is still negative. And so my resistance areas into the bounce are going to be met by sellers. And you can just eyeball where those sellers are going to be at first pass. They're going to be sitting right there. So my thought to use this, just had a very short webinar here today, wanted to talk to you about these pivot points. I use them every day and I use them intraday and they are remarkable at sending me in the right spaces because I'm trying to understand how to read them in the context of what the current market motion is.
A lot of us that really try to get a handle on technical indicators and the development of a strategy and a system inside of this space, we don't really grab on to that in the sense of saying, hey, listen, I know that this is going to, we're constantly just trying to pick tops and bottoms. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to pick tops, trying to pick bottoms. The best thing in the world to do, folks, is run with the trend. And I know that sounds extremely simplistic, but it happens to work. And it really happens to work very, very well. And so if you're there to make money and you're looking at these motions, just realize that that is the best thing to do. If you end up using moving averages, whichever one you like, doesn't really matter, but don't use the average to tell you what to do. If you come into an average, look to the left and look for congestion. Because guess what? Some of us are going to use an 18 exponential. Some of us are going to use a 20 simple. Some of us are going to use a 10 exponential. Some of us are going to use a 10 simple. Some of us are going to use a 5. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of people moving around, but big money moves the market and stays with the move. And so you have to realize whether something's just noise pushing you up into a space only to bring it back down, or if you're looking at a motion that's sitting just like this one that eventually collapses and then drifts you down into your areas of support. And using these pivot points, all you got to do is mark them. Okay, I lost this level. That's here. I need to start looking at my next congestion level. Oh, great. I'm not going to, as long as it doesn't break this congestion where the last group of buyers were overpowered to become sellers here, as long as it doesn't lose that area, I still have a nice valid short. And you do that until the drift in momentum. You watch it cross. When that cross is over positive and you've got momentum, you know this histogram is going to start printing on this side. And so you're going to look for the pullbacks into support to give you long action into the newest areas of resistance. All right. Hey, listen, I hope you take advantage of Motive Wave. It is a tremendous product. I've used it for many, many years. Again, like I said, since they were in the beta stage and they keep getting better and better and better. They have great customer service and I just enjoy using this software and I, I love the developers over there. They're great people and I heartily advise you to consider the product. And since I don't make anything from telling you that, you should, you should at least anticipate that it is quite sincere. So... Definitely, if you haven't gotten into it, just dig around there and look at it. I mean, you can do, take a look at this. You can change your pivot action to something as little as, I mean, I wouldn't want to do that, but you can do something that give you an hourly fib zone too. And if you were looking at a five-minute chart, it would give you the range of motion that you would need. You could slip that into a four hour fib zone and it would give you the range of motion. And notice this, these things are great. They come in, they reject the area. You can tell what is going on. It holds the region. If you watch it come up, notice this is positive now. So it says the pullbacks into support are going to get bought, but because the bigger picture is negative, you know, you're going to bump into sellers at resistance. And that's exactly what this chart is telling you. I have time for maybe one or two questions. I see you use a Mac. You know what? I work with interactive brokers and so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Hate it that they give me that pacing violation, uh, off and on, but, um, I have some accounts with interactive brokers that I use. So which edition of Motive Wave am I using? The professional edition. You think I, IB is slower than IQ feed? Really? 
Well, that's worth a note right there. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. All right. Any more questions, comments, anything like that? Hey, listen, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. I'm learning your SMI setup. Can you give me your thoughts about what it's telling you at the moment? Regarding what? Regarding what instrument? First webinar from, hey, glad to have you, Luke. Spy. All right, let's go to Spy. All right. Well, Spy is essentially telling me the... Well, those of you that work with me every day, you know what it is, I think, about what we're doing here. Um, here's my thought. I believe that a lot of people went short very early here in Spy. Um, very early, much too early, as it's come into resistance. And so I have no idea in what way you mean this. So we'll look at a daily, and we'll see where it is this chart actually is from this space. Let's delete all these intraday fib zones. And we'll leave the weeklies sitting up here. We can see these weeklies event. Notice this. Do you see momentum, how damp it is here? damp, still very high, just using the MACD. If I use the SMI, you know, if you don't, if you don't really know how to read that uh, SMI, then um, makes things a little bit tougher. But if we are just looking at the uh, fast SMI, we can see that it's still in trending territory. Right? That fast SMI is still in trending territory, and it looks just like the MACD, really up there. So here's the thing, folks. Trend is always in control. Trend is always in control until it isn't. And that's all we can do right there. And if we see the sideways action, we see trend holding, guess what? It is very likely that where this chart looks like it's going to roll over, you're going to see buyers come right back in and shove it back up. We've got no rotation telling us that we've got a lower high on the horizon yet. We still have none. Look, low, high, little bit of mess, another high. Higher low relative to this one, of course. Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high. Guess what? Even if it does pull back, it is going to bounce. We have no rotation. Here's how a breakdown looks. You have your highs and your low, and then your high and your higher low, and your high and your higher low. And then you have a lower high. And then you have a lower low. And then it breaks down, it comes up and tests your space. And you have a higher high, then you, have a, then you have a lower high. And then the chart starts rotating over. Only after rotation do we get rid of all these enthusiastic buyers, folks. They're not gone. This chart is not rolling over. I mean, it's not going to do that. There's no way. Too much momentum, too much slope. So pullback's still going to get bought. We've got to watch for the formation that gives us a lower high. And so far, these buyers are just super, super attached to upside in the market. As someone who's never used Motive Wave or any sophisticated trading platform, is a professional edition a good starting point? Hmm... If you intend to trade, Motive Wave is fantastic. And using a professional edition will allow you a number of things, including replay mode, which will allow you to trade with the chart as it actively builds its candlesticks. And that's really what a person needs. You can read a thousand books about basketball 
But if you don't get out there with a ball and start shooting at that hoop, you're not going to be a good basketball player. So you've got to practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. So if I say, hey, listen, if you're getting in here to make money, you get that professional edition. You make sure that you have all the tools. You study from all the folks that you can and you practice before you put any real money in the market. That's what a lot of people don't do. I didn't do it. I really wish I had, but I didn't. Just started trading real money, and that, I have to tell you, is like the worst thing you could possibly do for yourself. Just much, much better to practice, practice, practice. And this replay version, the replay mode is phenomenal to help you see how trends move in the market. Absolutely beautiful. Last thing I want to leave with you is please do not read your technical momentum indicators as overbought or oversold. If they are sitting, if price action is sitting on top of moving averages and your momentum indicators are reading very high levels, it is telling you simply that range expansion is still likely but not likely to hold. It is also telling you that pullbacks are going to be bought. And right now, these things are in very aggressive trending spaces, could easily end up breaking down, but shorting the low, certainly not the trade of the day. All right. Hey, that's it. Thanks for coming. Hopefully, I'll see some of you guys sometime, and I know some of you I'll see in the morning. Take it easy. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye-bye.